Hi everyone, welcome to Vantage Life Analysis Session. Right, so for today, we will be covering on FX market overview. So we will be looking at key news that impact the FX markets recently. At the same time, we'll also be going to, as usual, write our economic calendar to see if there are any key events. For today, we are doing it slightly different. So we won't be looking much at charts, but rather what we will be doing is covering key questions, right? So just in about one to two more minutes, right? I'll be sharing the agenda. So let's give it about one to two more minutes for more people to join us and we will get the session started. As usual, right? For those of you guys who are here with us right now, if you guys have any questions, any charts that you want us to look at, please do put them under the questions chat and we will review them together. Okay, let's get the session started. So for those of you guys who just joined us, a very warm welcome. Right, so for today, we will be covering on FX market overview. So just a quick introduction of myself, right? I'm Lee Singh. I provide FX advisory to institutional clients. I'm also part of the team that's recognized by the Technical Analyst Awards as finalists for the best FX research. If you guys are watching this with us live right now, and if you have any questions, right, do put them under the questions chat. If not, Please, if um, you're watching a recording of it, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn for any content that we do on Wednesday, Thursdays, or Fridays. Okay, so just a quick disclaimer before we get the session started. The information presented here, it's not to be treated as investment advice. It's for educational purposes only. If you guys have any questions with regards to specific charts that you want us to look at, do put them under the chat as well and we'll take a look at them together. So this is the agenda that we will be covering for today, right? So first, we will be going through key news events surrounding the G7 currencies. For this, I'll be going through mainly on two events, right? The more recent ones. And then also at the same time, we will be going on to the economic calendar, following which we will go on to the hawkish, uh, to understanding more on hawkish and dovish central banks, essentially what the stance represent and what is the impact on the currencies. And then we will also cover interest rates differentials, right? So... I believe when we are doing um, trading FX in general, right, a big part of it would be looking at basically uh, FOMC or Fed interest rate decisions or any other central bank's interest rates decisions for that matter because it will impact, uh, impact the currency's movement. So for that, we'll look at interest rates differentials and also what is the impact of higher interest rates, how do they drive currencies, right, and compare the different interest rates between the currencies. And then finally, right, let me just clear these drawings. We'll also look at market risk sentiment, right? So I believe most of us here, we have heard of pretty much um, the word market um, risk off, risk on sentiment being thrown around. So we'll look at how we can determine market risk sentiment, understand a little bit on how market risk sentiment can actually impact currencies and look at the difference between the categories of the currencies, right? So we have the safe haven and the commodity currencies. So we'll take a look at that and also how it actually impact different currencies and how we can use it to determine the market risk anthem. So this is roughly the agenda that we will be covering for today. Okay, so just before I go on to this key news events, right? So as usual, let's hop onto the economic calendar. So we'll hop onto the economic calendar and see if there are any key events to watch out for this coming, uh, this coming week. Okay, so let me just bring up the 
browser. So for economic event, you can use Forex Factory or you can use Vantage Markets Economic Calendar. Right, so I do use them interchangeably. So for Forex Factory, you can see here, right? So essentially just search Forex Factory, go under calendar. You want to change the timing as well to make sure that it's suited to your local time. And then essentially this is the area so you can filter, right? So in general, I look at only the ones in orange and red because these are the ones with medium impact and high impact news. So these are the ones that I'm looking at. So in this case, you can see that coming up at 9.30, which is about one and a half hours time, we have US data being released. So quite a few key events on dollar data. We have flash PMI data coming up as well as unemployment claims. So this will all be a measure of the economic outlook, right? And more importantly, because recent inflation data showed that price pressures are easing. So if price pressures are easing, right, um, there could be a case where we can finally see, along with price pressure easing, there's also a slowdown in economic growth, right? And this can be reflected in terms of the health of the labor market as well as the manufacturing sector. So yeah, so these are the ones to look out for. Then of course, at, um, later on as well, we'll be having the FOMC meeting minutes. So these are the key events mainly for this week, right? So with that, let's go on to our slides. Okay, so apart from just looking at the economic calendar, other key events that we have surrounding this would be in the Eurozone. It's uh, on Thursday, right, which is tomorrow, they are having a debate. So EU energy ministers will be meeting to have a debate over the EU gas price caps. So essentially what's happening is that with the whole um, Russian-Ukraine conflict and as well as the energy crisis and the pandemic, right, so all of these factors coming together, there's a supply constraint in energy, right, and this coupled with the fact that we have winter approaching and this lack of supply is pushing prices higher. So with that, um, EU energy ministers are basically coming together to discuss or rather debate over the EU price uh, gas price caps. So the block itself has proposed a cap on natural gas prices and it stands at 270 euro watts per megawatt hour. But right now, there's conflicting views on it, right? And so some of them are saying that it's too expensive. There's no point in imposing such a price, high price cap because they cannot sustain buying gas prices at this price for a prolonged period of time. So that's uh, tomorrow they'll come together and basically decide or debate on this. So the idea behind the price cap is essentially to limit the cost for consumers. So especially so for Eurozone as well as the UK region because they are heavily or rather they are net energy importers. So what they do is that they import energy for their own consumption. And because of this, when energy prices are rising, it hurts their economy as well. As, and more importantly also because both in the Eurozone and the UK, right, they are experiencing high levels of inflation standing at decades high. But apart from that, demand is not reflecting in terms of the growth as well. Okay, so in this case, right, what happens is that when you have slow demand or slower growth, but rising price pressures, it introduces the risk of stagflation. So the idea behind stagflation is basically when you have high inflation, but demand is not met, right? It's not, um, it's not demand driven, essentially. It's more supply driven. So you have a case where the costs of uh, producing this goods, it's increasing, but at the same time, right, people's income, the consumption power, their uh, purchasing power are not met with this rising prices. So, yep, so that will hurt growth. So this is uh, uh, just a brief outlook as in terms of the countries, uh, both regions outlook. And then separately, we also have oil prices, right? So for oil prices as well, right? Oil prices itself, they basically pushed lower for today right, or for this week, right? And a part of it is also based on the COVID concerns in China. So China has been adopting this zero COVID, zero, zero COVID policy where essentially they are ensuring that there is a, they're trying to curb the widespread of uh, COVID cases, right? So whenever there are a few cases, right, they tend to have stricter or more stringent lock, lockdowns or restrictions, right? So just in the past few days alone, COVID case count climbed more than 28,000 um, near levels seen during the lockdown period in April in Shanghai. So this is also weighing on the country's outlook. The reason for that is because China itself, they are one of the, they are the largest importer or consumer of uh, oil prices, right? So when you have a case where this, um, the world's largest importer of oil, it's currently seeing uh, um, 
grimmer economic outlook. What happens is that it will weigh on oil prices. If demand doesn't, it's not as optimistic, and essentially, it helps to uh, it push prices lower. Okay. So these are the few events that are surrounding the um surrounding the G seven currencies. Right, I have a question. Right, thank you for the topic for today. I wonder if we can know the G 20s meeting calendar and its ongoing effect on the market beside the usual economic calendar. Yes, you can. Right, so essentially, uh, you can go to. In in this case, right, you go to vantagemarkets.com. Just bring this up, right? So, in a uh, forex factories case. In this case, you can see that it's mainly reflecting more on the G, this would be the G7, no, G8 currencies, right? They don't have not and set. So in this case, right, you can go to vantagemarkets.com. It shows all the economic calendar. I mean, all the events. Okay, so under education and tools, economic calendar, you can see here. Right, so these are the key events. I believe that emerging markets ones as well. Yeah, so those are the key events. And again, right, it's pretty much the same thing. They are, uh, they are categorized according to the impact of the currency. So yeah, so these are the ones that you have here. All right, so you can see this ones uh, on Advantage website. Okay. Yeah, so in terms of the ongoing effect in general, I would say that economic outlook is definitely one of them. So key data to look at will be more on retail sales data and then as well as inflation. So inflation is probably the main driver right now for most central banks' interest rate decisions, right? So if inflation is climbing higher and if you have a case of a tight labor market, so similar to what we see in New Zealand, right? We have high inflation, but at the same time, labor market is still um, tight, right? So essentially, unemployment rate remains pretty uh, low. At the same time, we also have retail sales going strong. So in this case, when you have robust domestic growth, as well as a tight labor market with inflation, then it gives a higher case or it builds more case for central banks to raise rates to tackle inflation without hurting growth too much. Yeah, so that's that. those are just key events to watch out for. And then just now... I was talking about oil prices as well, right? So this is something you want to watch as well. EIA crude oil stock change. So this basically measures the measures the changes change in US oil inventories. So if demand is weak, right, and there's a drop in supply itself, then it helps, or rather, sorry, increase in supply, then this would push prices much lower, right? Because you have a case of less demand, but at the same time, uh, lower supplies. Okay. G twenty meeting on its effect. Uh, on its effect on oil. Oh no, not not G twenty meeting on its effect on oil, but rather the, in this case, this is more of the U.S. oil inventories. Okay, so I'm I'm talking about specifically the U.S. oil inventories data, and. In general, the uh, driver of oil prices would be more on the OPEC side as well. So OPEC plus um, production, right? So if there are any cut in terms of the production output, then that would be something to watch out for. So oil prices in general, the main one would be more on the oil inventories as well as OPEC. I think OPEC would have a higher, would have more impact on oil prices. And then also, of course, developments in China because China is one of the world's largest importer of oil. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. Okay, so let's take a look at the hawkish and dovish central banks now. So in general, hawkish and dovish central banks, right, we hear this term quite a lot. And also, we'll also take a look at the impact on their currencies. So what we mean by this is when we take a look at hawkish or when, in general, people mention hawkish central banks, right, the idea is that they are raising rates to rein in inflation. So... This could come at the expense of economic growth, right? So another way you can think of this, it's uh, in terms of tightening their monetary policy. So when they tighten their monetary policy, what this essentially means is that they are, so interest rates, you can think of it as the cost of borrowing. So when interest rates are raised, it becomes more expensive. So it makes money, supply becomes more expensive, right? So access to credit, it's more expensive right now. So when Central banks tighten their monetary policy. The idea is to cut down on consumption, right? So when market is in and or when the economy is uh, in an uh, expansion phase, 
what happens is that usually the economy is doing well, right? And at the same time, people have strong purchasing power, they have disposable income. So by cutting access to that um, or making the cost of borrowing, the cost of funds more expensive to access, right? This is supposed to cut down consumption. So higher interest rates will also benefit the currency. The reason for that is because when you have higher interest rates, think of it as you are earning basically more, right? In terms of holding a specific currency. So in general, when central banks are hawkish, right? So this example, it's reflected clearly in the Fed. When we saw that US inflation, it's pretty much demand-driven. So unlike the Eurozone and UK, right? Where theirs is more supply-driven inflation because of higher energy prices. In US, it's different. In US, it's demand-driven. So essentially, you have people with purchasing uh, a strong purchasing power and they're buying to push prices higher. So in cases like this, right? When you have higher uh, interest rates, it helps to curb supposedly curb spending and also lower the uh, increase the cost of borrowing and lower consumption. So higher interest rates also benefit the currency because in general, they are being paid more for holding the specific currency. So that's on um, hawkish central banks. So if you take a look at Fed, right, specifically uh, right now, what we have, right, so Fed has been raising interest rates and the reason for that is for them to fight inflation. So the, the hawkish central bank, right? So hawkish Fed in general, it's also helping to support the currency's uh, dollar's strength. So I think for the past, if you take a look at the chart, right? Since the start of the year, we have been seeing a strong dollar, right? So dollar has been on a strong uptrend. And this is also partly attributed to hawkish Fed. So essentially higher interest rates prospects, it helps to boost demand for the dollar. So the next one that we have is on dovish central banks, right? So dovish central banks, it's the opposite. So essentially they lower rate to boost inflation and also help to stimulate the economy. So this usually it's making the monetary policy, uh, loosening the monetary policy, making it more accommodative. So the idea is to ensure that there is easy access of these funds and it lowers the cost of borrowing for consumers. So when consumers have lower access or the cost of borrowing these funds in general, it's less expensive than consumers who borrow them and it helps to boost consumption. So in general, when central banks are dovish, right, currencies tend to depreciate. There's also this concept of basically uh, interest rate differentials, which, which we will cover in the later slides. But the idea is that if you have one currency that is paying higher interest rates against another currency that is much has much lower interest rates. So for example, the dollar and the yen, right? So dollar right now, Fed's interest rate stands at around 3.75% uh, to 4.25%, right? Whereas for the yen itself is negative 0.1%. So what happens is that we have will have a case where people are buying the dollar and selling the yen. So essentially they're selling all their yen holdings and changing it to the dollar because they can earn higher interest rates holding the dollar. So in general, when central banks are dovish, right, when they have uh, lower interest rates, the currencies tend to depreciate. So this is the idea. Okay, and then the next one that we will be looking at is basically how interest rates, differentials, interest rates, and real use drive the currency's performance. So in order to dive deeper into this, right, we need to first understand on nominal and real interest rates. So nominal, right? just means that these rates are usually the ones that are advertised, they're presented on paper, right? This includes your real interest rates and projected rate of inflation. So this is the rates that you are seeing in general, right? But what we want to actually find out more of, it's the real interest rate. So this is basically the actual return that we have considering inflation. So this is actually a measure of consumers purchasing power as well. So in terms of interest rates differentials, Right. Essentially, let's take a look at this example. Right. So interest rates differentials, as the name suggests, is the difference between two uh, interest rates of two currencies. So let's take a look at this example here. Right. So we have currency A. So we have currency A here. Right. So currency A gives uh, an interest rate that stands at about 3%. And then currency B, right, has a rate of 5%. So in this case, right, the difference in their interest rates would be basically the difference of this 5% minus 3%, right? So that's 2%. So in this case, what this means is that just by buying, or just by buying, so let's just name this currency B. So just by buying currency B and selling currency A, right, so I buy currency B, and I sell currency A, it earns me the difference of 2%. 
So essentially, I'm exchanging the currency B for cur uh, currency A for currency B, right? So selling all the currency A and then buying it into currency B and earning that two percent difference that it gives. Okay, so in this case, right, this is the concept of carry trade. So the idea is basically selling a lower interest uh, interest yielding currency for a higher interest yielding one. So this example, especially against the yen, right? So if you take a look at euro, yen, pound, yen, dollar, yen, basically any of these currencies against the yen because the yen is having negative 0.1% interest rate. So Bank of Japan is holding interest rates in, in a negative uh, territory, right? So essentially... They are, uh, people have to pay in order to put their money in banks. That's pretty much the idea, right? So this is to encourage spending. So in this case, you can see that against the yen, especially in times, uh, in good times, right? What happens is that people tend to go for the riskier currencies because they offer higher rates against the safe haven ones. And generally, Japan is considered a safe haven asset because of the political stability as well as, well as financial stability. So in this case, right, this is basically the idea of carry trade, buying one interest rates that give you a higher currency against one that has a negative interest rate or low, car or low interest rates. So recall that we, when we talk about FX trading, right, FX trading always comes in pair. So if you buy a currency, you have to sell it against uh, another currency. So when you talk about carry trade, the idea is basically earning the interest rates difference, right? So buying one with a higher interest rate and selling it against, selling against one with a lower interest rate. Okay, and then the last one that we have that's looking at the market risk sentiment as well as the impact on the currencies. So for the market risk sentiment, these are the four, uh, four factors that will impact the market risk sentiment. So maybe before I dive deep into these four factors, right, let's just understand a bit more on what market risk sentiment is right, and how, how we can actually categorize them. So for market risk sentiment, essentially it's referring to the market mode, right? So how participants are feeling, how and it of course, with the feeling, right, it reflects their behavior as well. And more importantly, it measures the risk appetite that they have. So what I mean by this is basically how willing they are to take on risks. So if participants are more risk on, generally what happens is that they tend to be optimistic about the economic outlook. So with that, they are more willing to take, take on risks. So you can see that in a risk on market environment, what usually happens is that risk assets, so this is, for example, your stocks, or even riskier currencies like your commodity currency, so specifically the Aussie, the CAT, and the Kiwi, right? So these currencies tend to appreciate in good times. So when investors are optimistic about uh, optimistic about the economic or global outlook in general, these currencies tend to benefit, especially against the safe havens. So the safe havens are the ones that we see over here. So you can see that in a risk-off mode, right? So essentially, this is when you see a lot of fear in the market. So investors would be holding more onto cash or even safe assets like gold. So in this case, when they're pessimistic about the economic outlook, when there's recession concerns, for example, they tend to shift away from risk assets. So you see that generally, if you load uh, Aussie dollar, Euro dollar, pound dollar, anything against the dollar, right? Dollar has been benefiting from the hawkish Fed. So we see that Fed has been raising interest rates. And in general, it helped to push dollar index higher, right? So basically dollar index is a measure of the dollar's performance against a basket of currencies, right? So this is mainly with their trading partners. So dollar index or dollar's performance in general, dollar has been going strong for this year. And if you look at any chart, right? Especially Aussie, Euro, pound, you can see that generally all of them are in a downtrend. So if you look, look euro dollar, pound dollar, for example, right? Go on to the weekly chart, you can see that they are generally in a downtrend, partly because of the strong dollar, that's one, and also the risk aversion seen in the market. So you can see that the outlook on euro, uh, euro region, UK, right? They're all suffering from supply-driven inflation, which means that there's higher risk of recession because demand, it's not meeting up with the increase in terms of price uh, pressures. So, yeah, so in a risk of uh, environment, right, investors are pessimistic about the economic outlook, they will move away from risk assets. So essentially what this means is that they will sell, for example, your Aussie, they sell Aussie and buy it, they buy dollar and they'll sell Aussie. So your Aussie dollar, right, because they're selling, it'll push lower. Okay, so in a risk of environment, you can see that risk assets will tend to suffer, right? Not just currencies itself, your stock market, cryptocurrencies, right? In general, especially with, for example, the FTX collapse recently, right? We saw that there's a lot of uncertainty in the crypto market, right? It's also spurring a lot of withdrawals from centralized exchanges. 
So yeah, so these are, th these are factors that can trigger. So just in general, what is the general market sentiment? Okay, so now that we have covered on market sentiment, I think one of the key questions is how do we measure market sentiment, right? So when we talk about risk off, risk on, neutral, how do you actually determine the market risk sentiment? So to determine the market risk sentiment, there are four factors that we can look at. So one of them, the first one is actually VIX. So VIX itself, in layman terms, right, it's a fear index. So think of it when the VIX is high, it just means that there's a lot of fear in the market, right? A lot of uncertainty in the market. In this case, what investors usually do is that they will shift away from this risk assets or this currencies. So you can see that when VIX is high in general, your stock market will not perform well. Cryptocurrency market, right? So this risk assets, basically assets that are associated with higher risk would tend to go down right? or it pushes lower. Whereas safe haven, like your dollar, franc and gold, so go is another one of them that I didn't include here, but go you can see in general, it tends to do well in times of crisis. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah, so this is one of them. Okay, and I have an interesting question as well, considering the effect of US uh, two-year bond as well as on top of the 10 years. So that's another thing that we can also measure, right? So basically the spread between the rates. Okay, so that it's uh yeah, this is actually an interesting one. So I was I was going to cover this. So yes, Chong, I'll definitely consider that. So considering the difference between the two-year bond as well as the 10-year uh the U on both of them, right? Because in general, right, so this is we also talk about uh inverted U curve. So the idea is that as times go by, right, if you have loans, so okay, maybe before that, right, just to explain a little bit more on treasury uh, bonds in general. So treasury bonds are basically loans to US government. So they are seen as very extremely safe um, asset because the risk of default is low. So in such cases, right, when you have a loan to, to government in general, right, this what happens is that when the time of the bond, so think of it as a, a maturity, right? So if you held a bond with a two-year maturity, for example, right, this because of the time to expiration, essentially what happens is that when you have you hold a bond with a much longer term investment, right? So let's say 10 years, right, you will be expecting higher returns. So in an optimistic environment, what usually happens is that the uh, U-curve itself, right? So the difference between your uh, shorter uh, time frame bonds as well as the longer time frame ones should, the time, uh, higher time frame ones would be the ones with higher interest rates. It makes sense because for a longer time that you hold these investments to maturity, they should be paying more interest rates. But in times of crisis, right, when it's uncertain, what happens is that the shorter time frame ones end up providing higher interest rates, right? Because there's more demand for them as compared to the, uh, there's less demand for them as compared to the longer time frame ones. So, so this is something to consider as well, right? So in terms of looking at the interest rates, differentials between the use differentials between the 10 year as well as the two year. So essentially it's, it's just the idea of longer term and shorter term bonds. Okay, so yes, that's a very good suggestion, Chong. And then, okay, so let me move on to dollar index, right? So for dollar index itself, this, uh, as we've covered, this is basically a measure of the dollar's performance against its major trading peers, right? So it's a basket of currency. So in general, because dollar is seen as a safe haven, so when dollar pushes higher, when dollar pushes higher, then this is generally seen as a risk-off environment. So when dollar push higher, right, it means that there's more demand for safe haven assets. So this is more, and this is it represents more of a risk off environment. And then of course there's U.S. ten year treasury U, right. So this one we talked about it. So in general, think of them as again, right, because these bonds are considered safe assets. So use move inversely, uh, move in in an inverse uh, direction to bond prices. So when U.S. ten year treasury U goes up. What this means is that bond prices are pushing lower. When yields are up in general and bond prices are down, right? it means that there's less demand for the safe haven assets. So in general, it represents a more risk-on environment. right? So in a risk-on environment, people will shift away from the safe haven assets and they move to more risky assets. So when US 10-year U itself is up, then this represents a more risk-on environment. When US 10-year U is down, it represents a more risk-off environment. Okay, and then something else that Chong added as well, right, it's looking at the difference in the rates between the US two-year bond as well as the 10-year. So essentially, in the normal environment, right, where investors are optimistic, 
the ones uh, investments that has a longer holding period should by right return higher um higher rates right so they investors should be rewarded more for holding on to a longer period so that's the idea right so if you have a case where in a very uh, pessimistic environment that's when your shorter term interest rates will be higher right leading to an inverted yield curve and then we have the SPX. So SPX is basically a measure of the stock market's performance. It's the largest 500 um, US companies. So in this case, uh, SPX in general, it's a measure of the stock market's movement. So stock market is seen as a risky asset, right? So when prices are pushing higher, this is when, when your stock market is going higher. It usually represents a more risk on environment because of the demand for this risk asset, right? When your SPX is down, this is usually a more resolved environment. Okay, so right now the current market climate that we're in, it's uh, interesting, right? So you can see that if you take a look at US 30 or SPX in general, I believe on the weekly time frame, you can see that there is this uh, bearish move down, right? Essentially, if you look at market structure, it's a series of lower lows and lower highs, right? Markets are in a downtrend for that. And then if you take a look at dollar index, dollar index is on a very strong uptrend, partly also driven by fundamental reasons with the Fed pushing rates higher, right? So with this environment uh, currently, and then there's of course recession concern as well as Russian-Ukraine conflict. So all of this going on and the energy crisis and outlook in general for the Eurozone and UK specifically, right? It's not uh, that fantastic because of, you know, it's exacerbated by the energy crisis. So all these events, you can see that in general, right? It's pointing. Uh, I haven't taken a look at the VIX specifically, so we can take a look at it on the chart later. But if you look at just the, an overview of dollar index, then uh, US 10-year use as well as SPX, you can see that dollar index itself has been pushing strong and stock market has been trending lower. So yeah, so just something to keep in mind when you do measure the market risk sentiment. You can also weigh the difference, right? So if, gen and if all these factors are pointing to a strong risk-on or risk-off environment, what you can then do is that it has implications for this currency. So in the risk-on environment, again, right, you can see that Aussie, CAT, and Kiwi tend to do better or do well. In a risk-off environment, these currencies tend to appreciate. So one way you can use this tool is that once you've come to uh, identify the market risk sentiment, what, what you can actually do is that in a risk-on environment, you can, for example, buy Aussie against the yen, right? So maybe buying Aussie yen or buying Kiwi yen, for example, right? So these are ideas that you can explore in terms of how you can combine the risk sentiment as well as trading FX. Okay. So let me just clear this, right? So with that, we have... Uh, pretty much come to the end of the slides, right? So I'll just do a brief summary of what we've covered so far. So we talk about the key news events surrounding G7 currencies, right? So the key, key data to look at in terms of the recent ones would be most uh, the ones that we're watching right now. Of course, in terms of the events would be your FOMC meeting minutes, as well as a slew of US data coming up in about an hour's time. And then in the Euro region, right, right now they're debating more on the price caps as well as uh, price caps for energy, right? So right now energy prices are soaring high. And then in terms of oil prices, we're looking at how uh, the impact of basically China and developments in China and how it actually impact oil prices. Something else that we have also covered for oil prices is looking at OPEC's output production, right? So OPEC's output in general would impact oil prices. So, the recent one, they have actually cut uh, output by 2 million barrels per day. Right? So that's something. And they might be going on with this production cut since demand is expected to be weak, right? given all the recession and macro headwinds that we are looking at. And then in terms of the second uh, portion of it, right, we covered on hawkish and dovish central banks. So in general, hawkish central banks just means that there is... Uh, there is intention for higher interest rates, essentially to stem inflation, right? So hawkish, it's good for the currency. So when central banks adopt a hawkish stance, currency should appreciate higher. In a dovish um, central banks, right? So previously we saw that before inflation actually took a turn for the worse, right? ECB has been pretty dovish. So that was before they started hiking rates, right? To basically, the idea is to bring in inflation. Okay, and then let's uh, and then we also have interest rates differential. So we took a look at basically how interest rates between the different currencies can actually impact the performance. 
right? And then finally, we also take a look at market risk sentiment. We take a look at how the different currencies would, uh, how the different factors rather would impact the market risk sentiment, how we can possibly measure them. So for this, we cover specifically on the VIX, the US 10-year Treasury U, the SPX, as well as the dollar index, right? So how it actually impacts the market risk sentiment. And also we talked, took a look at the safe haven, so the categories of the currencies, right? So whether they're safe haven or their risk assets and also um, how they can actually benefit in terms of how it's the market sentiment is actually linked to how we can possibly treat them, okay? Okay, so we have another question, right? So I hope you can take a give a take on this given the current outlook that a two-year bond is higher than the 10-year bond. What else will converge this uncertain economy into a possible recession? How's data? Thank you. I think a big part of it now would be, of course, one of it would be China, uh, China in general because China's slowdown, it's going to impact um, quite a lot of economies, right? So for example, um, Australia, New Zealand, they are, China is one of their largest trading partners. So when there's slowdown in China, it will impact them as well. So that is one. And then of course, the other one would be really looking at the rising uh, prices, right? So I think for this, uh, in terms of the rising gas prices in general, Eurozone and UK would stand the most loose, right? In terms of how, given the status of their economy because they are net energy importers. So unlike the US where they have their own oil uh, oil supplies, right? You don't have that in Eurozone and UK. So this is also something else to consider, right? So also, and this will bring us back to basically the point on where uh, demand, I mean, US itself, it's more demand driven, whereas for Eurozone and UK, it's more supply driven because of, because of basically their import, uh, their imports of energy. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, and then something else to take note of is that, of course, uh, looking at the technicals itself, would be looking at the dollars, uh, dollar index. So in general, right now, because of inflation, right, Fed officials are calling for rates to be terminal rates to be above five percent. So, uh, you can also take a look at Fed CME watch too. So this is something interesting. To let me just bring this out, right? So essentially, the Fed CME watch too. What it does is that you are able to see roughly how uh, markets are pricing it, the pricing in the Fed rates. So let me just show this. All right, you can just do a quick Google on the Fed CM, uh, CME Fed Watch tool. So let me just bring this up. Okay, so essentially this is uh what it is, right? So you can see that currently we are standing at about 375 to 4.25%. And then right now, right? So for December's meeting, we are looking at anywhere between 425 to 4.5%. So that it's a 50 basis point hike. So majority of the market participants are generally pricing in about 50 basis point hike. So you can see about 75% of them are pricing in a 75 basis point hike. And also, right, the terminal rate. So... In this case, you can see, I believe it's here. So you can take a look at the rates as well, right? So how the uh, how it evolves, right? So across the different periods, how are the different, um, uh, what was the percentage of market that's expecting a certain rate? So in this case, you can see that generally people are expecting rates to peak at around 5 to 5.25%. So what this shows is that we still have some runway to go, right? Because current rates are at about 375 to 4.25%, right? So we still have some way to go before it reaches about 5 to 5.25%. So if the Fed continue raising rates, right, we could see that dollar could still remain bullish. So what this entails, right, or what this implies when dollar is bullish, so dollar itself is a safe haven, right? So when dollar is bullish, other um, assets that are dollar denominated, like oil prices, right? And when dollar is strong, oil prices tend to suffer, right? Because it makes it more expensive to purchase uh, oil in foreign currencies given the dollar strength. And then gold, gold as well, right? So if you take a look at gold, gold is a dollar denominated asset. It has been on a downtrend pretty much on at the back or uh, on the mercy or uh, at the mercy of the dollar. Yeah, so these are things um, to consider, right? So if we're expecting rates to pick at around 5 to 5.25% and dollar continue to strengthen on the back of a hawkish Fed, then these are certain implications that we can look out for. 
Okay, so I hope that answers your question, Chong, right? So in terms of the asset class, then of course, when dollar strengthen, a stock market will be one of the asset classes as well. So stock market in general, they are risk assets, right? So if dollar continues to strengthen, then what is, this, what is the implication on stock markets? So I hope that that combined with technical um, perspective will give us, a, give us a clearer picture in terms of what are the asset classes to look at. Okay, so yep. So I hope that answers your question, right? So I think with that, we have come to the end of this session, right? If you guys have any questions, do put them under the chat, right? If not, if you have any questions with regards to the account, right? So setting out of your Vantage account, funding of the Vantage account, do email the questions to support at vantagemarkets.com. If you have any feedback for the sessions as well, right? If there are any topics that you would rather, uh, you would actually enjoy more, so... You can also put your questions or rather your feedback under the chat box. So I'll leave it for about one to two more minutes, right? So if there are any specific topics that you would like us to cover more, right, do put them under the chat. And then at the same time, right, you can also check out the Vantage, uh, the webinar schedule that we have, right? So go to vantagemarkets.com slash webinars. So you see the topics that are being covered. So for today, we're doing more of an FX market overview. For tomorrow, we are covering more on the beginners of FX trading. And then for Friday, I believe we're doing a price action masterclass, right? So this one is where we'll be reviewing the setups that were taken for this month. And at the same time, also diving a little bit deeper into smart money concepts. So understand supply demand zones and then how we can actually use them in our trading so yep so that's pretty much the schedule for the week right and i see that i have no other questions as well okay so with that we have come to the end of the session right thanks everyone stay safe trade safe take care right and we will catch you guys again tomorrow